Under consumer law, if you buy something online, you have 14 days within which you can return it, even if you don't have a reason, although there are some exceptions, of course. Whereas if you buy it in a shop, changing your mind is not a reason, unless the shop allows you to return it of its own goodwill. So today we're back in Lorchester and I have a conference with Mr. Tech, who's got lots of questions for me about buying things online, buying things in a shop, and whether things go wrong with those products and what his rights are. But if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law, so hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on future videos. Also, a big thanks to all 580 of you at the time of recording that voted on my poll as to seeing off-topic videos on what equipment I use, what a regular day looks like, and so on. 46% of you said yay to such videos, and 33% of you said yay, but put them on black belt secrets. So a video is going live today about what equipment I use, so make sure you subscribe there and check that one out. In the meantime, roll video. So first of all, Mr. Tech asked me whether he has any rights to return a product just because he's changed his mind. Now, if he's bought the product online, then he has what we call a cooling off period, which is a minimum of 14 days. Many shops give you more than that. Within that 14 days, he is entitled to return that product without any reason at all, although there are some exceptions. For example, if Mr. Tech orders a big plaque with his name and address and his telephone number on it, then this is a custom-made product, and once this has been delivered, even if it was ordered online, he won't have that cooling off period in which to return it, because it's been customised for his specific use. Speaking of custom products, one's thoughts might turn to a very popular technology company that offers a free service for engraving your name on each of its products that it supplies you. This would bring it outside of the 14-day cooling off period. Other exclusions include food and flowers, for example, because they are likely to perish within a day or two. Or, for example, tickets that are going to be useless the day after purchase this cooling off period is not going to apply. There's also an exception for music CDs, DVDs, music software, things like that, but usually where they have been unwrapped. So Mr. Tech is thinking about buying a very expensive camera and he's wondering whether it's better to buy it online or going to a shop and buy it because he's not really sure whether he's going to like the camera or not. So in this scenario, the general advice to Mr. Tech is that there's a big difference between buying this expensive camera online and buying it in a shop. Now, it doesn't matter how expensive or how cheap an item is that is bought online or in a shop, the same rights and the same rules will apply. If Mr. Tech buys the camera online, he's going to get this 14-day cooling off period within which he can return it even if it's not faulty. However, if he buys it in a shop and changes his mind the next day, then he's down to the discretion of the shop as to whether they're going to allow the return or not. Very often the shop will say that he can have an in-store credit to spend within the store, but even that is at the shop's discretion, and whilst most shops have a policy like this, it's not upheld in law. Unless there's a fault with the product, which is the next thing that Mr. Tech is interested in. I tell Mr. Tech that it's a common scenario in cases that come to me as a barrister, where there's a fault with a product and the retailer is insisting that they can repair the product. Maybe they need to send it away and it will be back in six weeks, Sometimes they insist that it's got to go to the manufacturer or even that the client or the customer has got to go to the manufacturer to get this product repaired. The important bit here is that there is a 30-day window within which the consumer has a right to return that product, regardless whether they've bought it online or bought it in a shop. The rights are the same, and regardless of whether it's a cheap item or a very expensive item, I'm talking many tens of thousands of pounds, it matters not if you've bought it as a consumer from a trader, which is somebody acting in the course of business, then the rights are the same. This is known as the short-term right to reject. But just to flag up, this doesn't apply to digital downloads. But in essence, if you've got a product that develops a fault or has a fault and that you notice this fault within the first 30 days, you are entitled to reject it for a full refund. But the law goes a little bit further than that. There are three broad categories in the Consumer Rights Act that might be of interest in this particular scenario. The first is that the product must be of satisfactory quality. This is the one that covers whether there is a fault, whether there is damage, or whether it is just generally not of satisfactory quality. Bear in mind, however, if it is a second-hand product, it's not going to be as perfect as a brand new product. So with a brand new product, you could expect it to be free of even scratches and minor defects, 
Whereas if it's second hand, then it may not be free of defects because obviously it's not brand new. However, if it is still faulty or damaged in some way, notwithstanding that it was second hand, then it might not be satisfactory quality. Secondly, the product must be fit for purpose. In other words, you should be able to use it and it should work for the purpose for which it was supplied. So in Mr. Tech's case, if he buys a brand new camera from an unknown brand that is supposed to take photographs and video, but when he gets it back from the shop, it doesn't actually take video as it was supposed to do, but the photographs are perfectly fine, then it isn't fit for purpose because the purpose it was sold for was both photographs and video, and if it doesn't work for one of those, then it's not fit for purpose and he is entitled to reject it within that first 30 days. But it's interesting to know as well that if a shopkeeper tells you that a product works for a particular purpose, even though it wasn't designed for that purpose, then it should work for that purpose. And if it doesn't, this will entitle you to return it and reject it for a full refund, even though that product isn't normally used for the purpose for which the shopkeeper has told you it does. And finally, the product should be as described. So if Mr. Tech gets his camera back from the shop and it is silver, but it was described on the packaging as black, even if he didn't open the box and have a look at it, even though he had the opportunity to do so, then again, he's entitled to reject it because it wasn't as described. If it was described as a black camera, it should be a black camera. If it turns out to be silver, he can reject it. So now Mr. Tech says, well, this is all very interesting, but I've got a camera that I've had for more than 30 days and has now developed a fault. Can I reject that, he asks. Well, the rules change after 30 days. You are no longer entitled to a full refund. You get a window between 30 days and the first six months. The general rule is this. If a fault is discovered within the first six months, then the law says that it is deemed to have been present at the time of purchase. Therefore, the retailer must offer either a repair or a replacement. In the event that the retailer accuses Mr. Tech of causing this damage or defect in the product, then it's the retailer's burden to prove within the first six months that it was Mr. Tech's fault and that they shouldn't have to repair or replace it. Interestingly enough, if Mr. Tech discovered this fault within the first 30 days and the retailer offered to repair it and Mr. Tech was happy for them to repair it, then his initial right to reject period will be put on pause for the full duration of the waiting period whilst the retailer tries to repair it. If, let's say, six weeks later, the retailer has failed to repair it, the retailer cannot then argue that he's outside of the first 30 days and thus doesn't have this short-term right to reject. The short-term right to reject is put on pause whilst the retailer tries to get it repaired. If they fail to do so, Mr. Tech can then exercise his short-term right to reject. Even though on a calendar he is outside of the first 30 days, the right to reject is still in force. This is the case regardless of the value of the goods. Think about a car purchase, let's say for £20,000. If Mr. Tech buys a brand new car from a dealer and then discovers a fault with it two weeks later, the dealer offers to repair it, but takes a couple of months to do so. A couple of months go by, the dealer still hasn't managed to repair the faults and Mr. Tech now just wants to give the car back. The dealer says he's not allowed to do so because he's outside of the first 30 days. Well, as I said, the law states that the initial right to reject is put on pause for the full duration of the waiting period whilst the dealer is attempting repairs of the vehicle. Moving on to the period after the first six months, the burden of proof shifts to Mr. Tech. So if Mr. Tech finds a fault after the first six months, the burden is upon him to prove that there was a defect with the product at the time of purchase. This may be possible in the event that the manufacturer releases a statement to say all of this product line has an inherent fault that they've only just found out about, but every product made at a certain date has this fault, then Mr. Tech can prove that this defect was present at the time of purchase and he can take it back to the retailer. Very often in this scenario, the retailer is going to say that Mr. Tech has to go to the manufacturer to get his money back but that's not the case. Mr. Tech's contract was with the retailer. The retailer may well have recourse against the manufacturer for supplying a defective product in the first place, but Mr. Tech's contract is with the retailer and it is the retailer 
that is obliged to provide the refund. Now, because there's essentially four main periods, the initial 14 days cooling off period for online purchases, 30 days as the short-term right to reject, the first six months and the second six months, lots of retailers seem to think that that's it for consumer purchases. They only have 12 months within which to make a complaint about a product. But the overall limitation period for contracts is six years. So whilst it will become increasingly difficult for a consumer to prove that there was a problem with the product in the first place as time goes by, the overall limitation period is six years. So let's take the scenario where Mr. Tech has bought a very specialist piece of equipment and it's three years until the manufacturer issues a statement to say, hands up, we've realized this has an inherent fault. It just doesn't work the way it was intended. So, so long as Mr. Tech is within the overall limitation period of six years, this statement from the manufacturer should be enough proof that there was a problem with the product in the first place. And his recourse, again, is to the retailer. A topic of frequent complaints is cars, because there are brand new cars and there are second-hand cars. Now, on the one hand, brand new cars can have their own inherent faults, but second-hand cars are more likely to have faults. Unfortunately, lots of car dealer traders think that second-hand cars are not caught by consumer regulations and law. So to put this record straight, if the car dealer is a business, then the same consumer laws and the same timeframes apply. Whilst there will be a difference as to what you can expect of a satisfactory quality for a second-hand car, in other words, there might be the odd scratch here or there, there might be a scuff on the wing mirrors or on the bumpers or even on the chairs, all these sorts of things. The older the car, the more these lines are going to move away from what you would expect a satisfactory quality from a brand new car. However, even though it's a second-hand car, if there are faults and defects with the car, you are still protected under the same consumer laws as though it were a brand new car. The obvious examples are going to be where a trader points out a defect to you and you buy the car anyway, even though you knew about it. For example, if the trader says, here's the car, but the boot latch doesn't open automatically like it used to do when it was brand new, if the trader points this out to you, then that's not going to be a fault that you can come back two weeks later for to insist on a full refund. On the other hand, if the fault is that when the car hits 40 miles an hour, the engine cuts out, this is obviously a serious fault and you could take it back to the dealer and reject it under your short-term right to reject. Now, just to be clear, all of these consumer rights only apply if it is a consumer purchase. That is where a consumer buys it from a business, not from another individual as a private sale. If you bought a second-hand car from a private individual, then your consumer rights will not apply, but you may be able to look at something under the Misrepresentation Act if the other person has lied to you about specific details about the car. Check out my video linked below on misrepresentation. I've had lots of questions over the years about guarantees and warranties, which usually run for six or 12 months, sometimes longer, but very often the retailer is going to say that because it's out of guarantee or warranty, there's nothing they can do about it. This is somewhat misleading because your overall limitation period is six years, but as I said earlier, it will become increasingly more difficult the more time goes on for you to prove that there was a problem with the product that is essentially the retailer's fault. Lots of questions also pop up about proof of purchase because retailers will very often refuse a refund if you don't have the original receipt. However, the shop only needs to have proof of purchase. This could well be from a bank statement which will have an individual line saying where the money was spent and how much was spent. Granted, if you bought several items in the shop, it's not going to show how much that individual item was but it is still proof of purchase nonetheless. Now, whilst many people might not think it's worth going to court over 20 pounds worth of purchase that goes wrong, Mr. Tech, on the other hand, has bought a camera, some microphones, some memory cards, lots of cabling, a bag and a tripod, several thousand pounds worth, and the camera's gone kaput in the first two weeks. He's lost the receipt and only has his bank statements as proof of purchase that he bought all of this equipment from the said shop in question. In my view, the shop is playing a pretty dangerous game by outright refusing Mr. Tech a refund in that scenario just because he doesn't have the original receipt. Because if this camera was worth £2,000 and has developed the fault within the first two weeks, he's within this first 30 days and has the right to reject the goods. Mr. Tech is quite likely to take the shop to court and on the balance of probabilities, by the time he's made his witness statement, 
annexed his bank statements that shows that he spent that money in that shop at that time and the shop is going to be obliged to provide full and frank disclosure as to what their sales were that day if indeed a sale matches up to Mr Tech's bank statement that he spent this couple of thousand pounds on this particular camera then Mr Tech is likely to win the claim. So whilst it is certainly easier if you have the original receipt that's not necessarily the end of the matter. But just as a quick tip from a barrister, whenever you buy anything in a shop, take a quick photograph of the receipt, store it online somewhere safe, then you will always have a record of the original receipt. Finally, just a note on some further protection. I make almost all of my purchases using a credit card. This means I have further protection under Section 75 of the Consumer Credit Act, further details in another video. But broadly speaking, this means if something goes wrong with the product, I also may have a claim against the card issuer with joint and several liability for the purchase between £130,000. But as I said, Section 75 claims probably warrant a whole new video, so make sure you subscribe to receive that one. I also didn't really touch on services under a consumer contract. Again, I have touched on those in other videos, but I will do another video specifically focusing on consumer service contracts. Also, I've no doubt that I haven't covered everything, so drop your questions in the box. I can answer them on future videos. Channel members' questions will be answered first. And don't forget to check out my upcoming video on black belt secrets on what equipment I use. I have Mr. Tech to thank for it. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.